Welcome to the 12th inaugural lecture of uh, Pan Atlantic University. Uh, we please implore you to rise now as the procession enters the altar. Please rise. National Anthem.
seated. The Vice Chancellor, members of the Governing Council, members of the Pan Atlantic University Senate, principal officers of the university, deans of schools, directors of centers and units, management, faculty, staff, and students of Pan Atlantic University are their guests. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, I welcome you to the 12th in the series of inaugural lectures at Pan-Atlantic University. An inaugural lecture is a noteworthy milestone in the career of an academic. It announces the one who has newly been promoted to the rank of professor or being appointed professor and provides them the platform to share their body of research and future research plans with colleagues, the wider university community, and the general public. Today's inaugural lecture titled, Diamond in Despair, the Macroeconomist's Frailty in Nigeria, will be delivered by Professor Perakuna Bright Erega of the Department of Economics, School of Management and Social Sciences, Pan-Atlantic University. Shortly, the Vice Chancellor will formally introduce our inaugural lecturer. Before that happens, please permit me to introduce the members of the high table. Dr. Michael Okolo, the Dean of School of Media and Communication. A round of applause, please. Professor Yinka David West, the Associate Dean of the Lagos Business School. Our inaugural lecturer, who in a few minutes will deliver the 12th inaugural lecture, Professor Perekuna Bright Erega. Our dear Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo. The Dean of the School of Science and Technology, Dr. Darlington Aholo. And last but not least, really, <laughs> the Dean of the School of Management and Social Sciences, Dr. Uluwashola Oni. My name is Kingsley Okoha. I am the Registrar. Madam Vice-Chancellor, I call on you to formally introduce the professor who will deliver the 12th inaugural lecture of Pan-Atlantic University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Inase Okonedo. Professor Perekuna bright Erega was born in Okuba, Ondo State, Nigeria, where he also received his primary education. He attended the Baptist Primary School, Okuba, and Uparama Grammar School, Bolowu, for his junior secondary education in a Seodo local government area in Ondo State. He then proceeded to Unity Secondary School, Odeaye, for his senior secondary education. He was later admitted to the University of Aduekiti, where he backed his BSc degree in economics in the second class upper division in 2002, and served with the Central Bank of Nigeria, Sokoto, for his National Youth Service Corps. He proceeded to obtain his MSc economics degree from University of Benin in 2006. He later obtained his doctoral degree, PhD in economics, from the University of Benin, under the African Economic Research Consortium sponsored collaborative PhD program in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2012. Professor Erega also obtained certificates in macroeconomic modeling at the University of Surrey, 
Guildford, United Kingdom, and panel data analysis from the AERC in Tanzania. Professor Erega was appointed Professor of Macroeconomics at the Pan-Atlantic University in September 2018. He is the current director of the PAD in Management Program at the Pan-Atlantic University, Lagos. He is a member of the Senate of the Pan-Atlantic University, where he chairs the Senate Committee on Results Verification. Professor Erega is currently an International Research Fellow at the University of Economics, Vietnam, a visiting faculty at the Center for Petroleum, Energy, Economics and Law, University of Ibadan, a non-resident faculty member with the NDIC Academy, Abuja, a faculty member at the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, and a council member at the Nigerian Economic Society. Professor Erega is currently leading the modeling subcommittee of the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Cape Town, to develop labor demand forecasting model for the services sector in South Africa. He was a member of the modeling team that designed the macroeconomic framework for the National Development Plan 2021 to 2025 and the Agenda 2050 of Nigeria. He is also a member of the technical review team to the National Development Plan 2021-2025 that was launched recently by the President. Prior to joining the Pan-Atlantic University, he was at various times a senior research economist and policy analyst at the Research Policy and International Relations Department of the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, Abuja a senior lecturer at the Department of Economics, University of Lagos, where he taught econometrics, simultaneous modeling, and macroeconomics for undergraduate and postgraduate programs, and a lecturer at the ADME College of Education, UNDU. Professor Erega has been at different times a visiting scholar to the IMF and the African Development Bank Macroeconomics Policy Forecasting and Research Department, Côte d'Ivoire where he led a team of researchers to carry out a study on the exchange rate management dilemma that Nigeria was facing in the 2015-2016 oil price plunge. The study titled, Nigeria, Should the Government Float or Devalue the Naira, was intended to guide the Nigerian government. He was also a panelist at the African Union meeting on trade and industrialization in Ethiopia and has been invited Price by Oxford University to present papers on African development issues. Professor Erega was also a member of the Capital Market FinTech Roadmap Committee, a panelist at the Security and Exchange Commission's budget seminars, and a member of the National Committee to undergo a study on the voice and voting power of the minority shareholders of Nigeria. Professor Erega has core knowledge in macroeconomic modeling and simulation, DSGE modeling, and macroeconomic policy analysis. He was among the five consultants that built the Nigeria Economic Summit Group medium term macroeconomic metric model on the Nigerian economy called NESG Mac Mode 2016 and the development planning relevant macroeconometric model and policy simulation for the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget and Planning. Professor Erega has designed and facilitated several trainings for commercial banks, microfinance banks, the NDIC, MDAs of both national and subnational governments, universities, and research institutes. Over the years, Professor Erega has consulted for various international and local institutions and has published several articles in peer-reviewed journals, chapters in books, and conference papers, among others. Professor Erega is an external reviewer to several journals and publications, including the NDIC, CBN, and SEC publications, and he is a member on the editorial team of a number of journals, including the NDIC Quarterly and the NES Journal. He has served as external moderator and external assessor examiner 
to several universities at home and abroad. Professor Erega is married to Mrs. Patience Erega, and the union is blessed with three boys, Tarila Divine Erega, Tariemi Dominion Erega, and Tariebi Delight Erega. I will now invite Professor Perekuna Bright Erega to the podium to deliver his inaugural lecture. Professor Erega. The Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, other Principal Officers of the Pan Atlantic University, the Deans, Directors, Head of Departments and Units, Members of the Senate and Congregation, Members of the Pan Atlantic University, Heredad Academics that are here, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon and welcome to the Pan Atlantic University, Lagos, Nigeria. It is with a profound sense of humility and gratitude to the Almighty God, the author and the finisher of my faith, that I stand before this distinguished audience to deliver the 12th lecture in the professional inaugural lecture series of this great university, the Pan-Atlantic University. This is the first inaugural lecture in the field of economics, the second from the School of Management and Social Sciences, and in fact, the first under Professor Enanse Okonedo as the Vice Chancellor. The first inaugural lecture from the School of Management and Social Sciences was delivered by Professor Onafowoko Oluyombo, with whom I was appointed full professor on, this, on the same day. His lecture was titled, The Accounting Profession, Throw Back, Throw In, Thank you. Throw Back, Throw In, and Throw Out. Madam Vice Chancellor, I am greatly honored for your kind approval and the privilege to stand before these learned colleagues, before my learned colleagues and distinguished audience to deliver this inaugural lecture titled Diamond in Despair, the macro Macroeconomist Freddy in Nigeria. I'm particularly humbled because understanding purpose and having a very dear relationship with the manufacturer himself afford me this opportunity to stand before all of you. I'm from a village where the water we drink is from, where, from the same place where we pass at excreta. The same water with oil spill everywhere is what we take our bath with. I always tell people that if you are looking for the definition of a village, just visit mine. As I stand before you, I can count how many degree holders we have in my community and how many professors there are in the old local government area. I remember at a time Professor Enase Okenondo asked me in one of the Senate meetings where I am from. And when I said I am a judge, she said jokingly, a judge also like book like this. Several years ago, as an undergraduate student, I decided that I would obtain my PhD degree before looking for any job because I wanted to be a professor on or before my 40th birthday. On the 4th of September 2018, I celebrated my 40th birthday. And in the same month, I was appointed a full professor in this great university. This is not mere coincidence. It is purpose and God at work. All glory to him alone. This is the power of understanding and maximizing purpose. Let me put my lecture today in context. Madam Vice Chancellor, you are aware that sometimes selecting a topic for inaugural lecture is, some, is, is a challenge. However, when Nigeria celebrated a Diamond Jubilee in the year 2020, I picked keen interest. So look at the macroeconomic conditions over the years. And the question was, how has Nigeria feared in the lead up to the celebration of the Diamond Jubilee? We know that the Diamond Jubilee celebration is supposed to be a mark of rest and consolidation, but can this be said of these current macroeconomic conditions in Nigeria? This is from the basis of my lecture at the Rotary Club Ikeja sometimes in November 2020. However, following a costly look at the issues and some of my research findings, 
Recently, I began to take a more holistic view of whether Nigeria is celebrating a diamond jubilee in rest and readiness for consolidation or in macroeconomic despair, thus necessitating some radical macroeconomic policies for takeoff. We are aware that macroeconomic policies are the main tools available to the macroeconomists to alter the direction of macroeconomic outcomes. And Nigeria is not devoid of sound macroeconomists. In fact, in this hall, we have a number of them, several professors of macroeconomics sitting there. Neither has Nigeria lacked the formulation of these policies over the years. Consequently, two questions come to my mind. If Nigeria is actually celebrating a diamond jubilee in despair, two things will arise from my lecture. Number one is that, is the macroeconomics in frailty, despite formulating several sound macroeconomic policies for the past 60 years? If the answer is yes, what are the foundational issues overweighing these macroeconomics or the policies that have been implemented for the past 60 years? While sound macroeconomic policies are critical for macroeconomic stabilization, stabilization and growth sustainability, there seem to be more fundamental issues imperative for successful implementation of effectiveness, for successful implementation, of, implementation and effectiveness of these policies. So, that we are, so, that, so as not to change shadows. Madam Vice Chancellor, this is the cross of my thesis today and my proposition in this lecture. Let me take us through a journey. First, I want to look at Nigeria. I want to have a reality check on Nigeria in the year 2020 when Nigeria has, I mean, celebrated a Diamond Jubilee. For example, if you look at the figure that will be presented next, look at that figure. You will see in that figure, I presented to you, I present to you a number of macroeconomic outcomes, several of them almost up to 2025. Now, out of them, we could see that reasonably Nigeria has not fared well after six, six years of this journey. And why do I say so? If you look at regrowth, regrowth in Nigeria is, it was negative in the year 2020, even though on average has been 2%. But some worrisome figures that I want to mention are figures like poverty, for instance. Poverty in Nigeria, as at that time, we have about 98 million people that were in poverty. That represents almost about 40% of the population. Now, in the word poverty clause says that in every one million, six Nigerians go into poverty. Imagine the number of minutes we have spent here. You can imagine how many people are already in poverty in Nigeria. Six Nigerians. In fact, in that same year, 2020, we had about 10 million out of, job, out of school children, 10 million. And in fact, it's established in the literature that one in every five Nigerians, I mean out of job, five out of job children are Nigerians. That means that one fifth of out of job children in the world are in Nigeria. Imagine that kind of figure. 60 years, and this is what we could see. For that, for that to buttress my point, for instance, if you look at debt service to revenue ratio is you know, almost above 60%, and we have a debt that is about 31 trillion as of that year. So if you look at all of this figure, a number of things can be raised. Number one is that I can say currently here that Nigeria was, is, you know, is having an almost about five deficits. And what are these deficits? Nigeria has infrastructural deficit because infrastructure to GDP as of that year was about 35%. Nigeria is suffering from in, in institutional deficit because that same year, Shadland Governance Index, Index showed that Nigeria was the worst governed country in the world. So institutionally, we have deficit. Nigeria also has capital market deficit because equity market to GDP ratio in Nigeria was about less than 10%. Compared to South Africa, that has about 321%. You can imagine the dis difference. And we are the giant of Africa, right? Nigeria also has physical deficit because over the years we have run, you know, deficit financing all through. And lastly, Nigeria has current account deficit. Almost five deficits can be recognized from this table. From this table, I can categorically say that after 60 years, Nigeria was in economic despair. Okay, after 60 years. Now the question is that almost 60 years of formulating macroeconomic policies with sound macroeconomic policies in the macroeconomics in the country, helping government to formulate 60 years of policies and being implemented. This is the outcome after 60 years. My question is that is the macroeconomics not helpless? Is he not carrying a load that is more than him after 60 years of formulating these policies? This is the cross of my presentation. Let me take us to a journey. I want to take us to a journey, and my first journey is to compare when Nigeria started in 1960 and then the year 2020. Now, if you look at this figure, 
1960, Nigeria GDP was about 4 trillion. But in, in 2020, we were about 154 trillion. Now, if you, if you do your calculation, you think that we were growing. But this is nominal GDP. And it could be explained by price effect. Now, GDP growth in Nigeria, really GDP was about 0.2%. But in that year, we had about negative 1.92. Well, we can explain that because 2020, there was recession. Fine, but on average, Nigeria growth has been 2%. So we couldn't see any far difference for, for our growth rate as at the year we started and then 60 years after. GDP per capita in Nigeria in the year 1960 was $93. This was far better than that of China that was about $85. But after 60 years, our GDP per capita is about $2,230. China currently is about above $10,000. This is a country that we're far ahead before. And several other countries that were far ahead, this is the story. Life expectancy in Nigeria as at the 1960 was 37%. Currently, it's about 53%. We couldn't say that after 60 years, there could be any gap. It means that if you are, living, if you are above 53 years, you are already across the threshold. And you are, you, are, you are experiencing grace because for Nigeria, it's about 53%, 53 years. Okay? Population in Nigeria at 1960 was 45 million. But at the year 2020, we were about 209 million. It means that the only thing that was growing in Nigeria is population. Because UK that colonized us, as of that year, was about 50-something million. Currently, UK is about 65 million. Nigeria moved to 209. We were just growing in population probably without control, or probably some other things that were beyond our control, and that is where we have found ourselves. So, if I look at this figure, and I do some calculation, you agree with me that with this kind of average growth of 2%, you take Nigeria about 35 years to double our GDP. But in terms of population, we double our population in 24 years. That is about nine years gap. That explains the reason why today we have poverty, unemployment, underemployment, mystery index, and the social unrest that we have. Madam Vice Chancellor, Imagine Nigeria in the next 24 years, especially Lagos that is about 20 million people now. In the next 24 years, Lagos population will double. Look at the level of social unrest that we have today. Uh, recently, even in the BROT, somebody was kidnapped and killed, right? Look at the conjectures everywhere. In 24 years' time, I pray you'll be alive to see what will happen in Nigeria if nothing is done about it. 24 years' time to come. You can imagine the kind of traffic that we will experience, right? But I know that we know how to pray and say it's not our portion. But some things don't change by prayers. They pre happen by plan, right? So this is the kind of story that we have in Nigeria. Now, if I take a step further to just buttress my point, over the years, Nigeria, you know, in terms of structure, has, you know, been dominated by the non-oil sector. And sometimes, if you are not careful, they say the non-oil sector, Nigeria is well diversified. But the truth is that non-oil sector uh, accounts for uh, you know, currently about 91% of our GDP. But in terms of export, non-oil sector contributes less than 10%. The oil sector that contributes less than 9% is the one that is dominating at the, at the export side, meaning that our products are not good enough to cross our border. And that could be explained from the fact that we don't have strong economic complexity index. We have issues around, you know, production complexity that could make our goods to be more competitive to cross our border. This has been the story in Nigeria, right? And if you look at the transition also, we started from agrarian economy, and we thought that in industry we pick up before we jumped into into services. And I'm wondering what you are servicing. Because transition start from agrarian, you move to industrialization, then you move to servicing. But this is, not this, this is not our story over the last 60 years. Let me take us into a political journey. And I will take the political journey to start with 1960. When Nigeria gained our independence in 1960, we operated a three-region system, and it was a UK parliamentary system. Lagos was the FCT, and then we have three regions. We have eastern, northern, and western region. And if you look across us at that time, we were dominating in some product. For instance, the western region was dominating in palm oil, even in the global world. Northern region was granite oil, and then the western region, we have cocoa. Today, we still have cocoa house built after several years. You know, today, there are buildings that are built in Nigeria that are collapsing. But 60, how many years ago, the building that was built through the process of cocoa is still standing, right? It means that as at that time, we have some level of stability, some level of economy that was, you know, doing well. But my, my issue is not about that. My issue is that as at the time Nigeria gained our independence and we separated into three, you know, regions, we never actually had a national vision. What do I mean? Immediately we took over from the colonial people and we were united to fight them out of Nigeria and we, we got government. What we did was that we went into our regional interests. 
The northern people formed their party, the eastern people formed their party, and then the western people formed their party. We actually were united to fight an enemy, but the truth was that it was actually not our enemy. Because we never, had, we never thought it wise to say that this is our country, and then we have a vision where we want to be, and the reason why we want the country from them. But when we took over, from the foundation, we were divided. And that is why till today, that division is fighting us. Okay? Let me just take a step for that to also buttress my point. When the United States took over, I mean, um, had their independence from the United Kingdom, the same country that colonized us. What they did was that they have what we call a, 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 um, they have what we call a declaration of independence. And in that declaration of independence, you can check it out online, they entrenched the vision where they want the country to be, the kind of country they were thinking about. And some of the things they put down as at that time was that they said, we owe this truth that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain rights which are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, for us, we never had that. So, that we formed the reason why the United States, as at that time, considering their diversity, could take a step further to detach from the UK and then establish what we call a presidential system that was different from the United UK parliamentary system. Because they knew where they were going. They don't need to, you know, adopt a system that probably would not be good for their diversity and for the kind of vision they had. For us, we never had. Now, in, in, in one thing that looked like almost like a vision for us that we never entrenched in any document to guide us through was our first national item. And there is a statement there that I liked. And it says, though tribes and tongues may differ, in brotherhood we stand. Today, can we say in brotherhood we stand? Along the line, that, that national item was thrown to the, to the dustbin. And today, you, what is reflecting our country is a country that, you know, three people or three major uh, tribes took over then, and then went into their personal and re uh, regional interest. That was what's reflected in, in the country, and that is the foundation that is still fighting us is today. Let me take some step further to show us some interesting stories. For instance, in 1960, sorry, the one before, sorry. For instance, in 1960, you find out that in the First Republic, in the First Republic, we had what we call the 1963 Constitution, right? Now, in 19... Uh, 79, we have what we call the 1979 Constitution. And then the Third Republic, 1993, then 1999 Constitution. Now, if you look at all of these constitutions, as part from the 1963 Constitution, all the constitutions that were drafted for us were drafted for us by military people. Military people. Because the transition was from military government to democratic government. And military people don't rule by constitution, they rule by decree and edit. And imagine those kind of systems drafting a constitution for us. That was one foundational problem we had. The second foundational problem I traced was that we started with a UK parliamentary system and then we moved to what we call a US presidential system. My question is, what informed this kind of movement from UK parliamentary system and then to the US? Is it because we have vision where we want to be and think that the UK is not good enough for us and then we move to the US? I don't think that was the answer. And my next point is that we moved from three region to four region, and then along the line we moved to 12 states, 19 states, 21, and then 36 plus FCT. What could have informed all of this expansion politically? Is it to bake the national cake, or it is to divide the national cake? Today, if you can get a country, you have access to the national cake. Maybe that might be the reason why everybody is clamoring for state creation, and today we have about 774 local governments having access to the national cake. So what that kind of system will do is to keep productivity. And in economics, we say that growth is the accumulation of factors of production and the productivity of these factors. Now, three things keep productivity. Number one is institution. And these are institutional issues and foundational issues that we have. Number two is human capital. When human capital is not well developed, expect, institution, I mean, expect that productivity will be killed. And last one is technology, right? So this is where we find ourselves. We expanded without a vision guiding us. Our constitution was not drafted by... By, by a civil system. So in the, in the 60s, we have a, some level of stability and civility, but that was thrown into the dustbin because this transition was not actually guided by anything that we could say that could agenda productivity. Now, in all, we could see that this same constitution in 1979 that I'm talking about, we had three arms of government, we have exclusive leave, concurrent leaves, and residual leaves. And the, concurrent, the, the exclusive leaves is top heavy at the center. So everything goes to the center. So today we have what we call almost how many number of House of Red members just in Abuja. And we have how many Senate members in Abuja. And what you see in that kind of a system is that cost of governance will just be increasing. 
That explains why over how many years, from 70 to date, Nigeria is running a deficit finance. Oh, and today we have about 31 trillion uh, debt. Even though in 2005 we had some debt forgiveness, but today look at the way the debt is increasing. Right? This explains that. Also to buttress my point is that in, in, in the process of finding out all of these loopholes and foundational issues that we should have corrected, what we found out is that government at the center will just form ministries and MDA. So think that that will solve the problem. Anywhere they find problem or something they could not solve, they form MDA and ministries there. And what that will do is to keep on increasing government expenditure, which mostly recorded expenditure, and then overblow our, our budget and then today see what is happening. This is the situation. Nigeria is a place where just a case in my village where nobody knows takes place and it has to be settled in the Supreme Court that is in Abuja. That's what happens. Nigeria is a case where the, the, the accountant general of the federal government is the accountant general of the federation. Even though we say we're in a federalism. That's the kind of foundation and the kind of constitution we have. And I'm not surprised at the figures we saw after 60 years. Let me also take a step further to tell us that 60 years of Nigeria, 30 years of this were from the military government, military rule, and then 30 years was from democratic rule. Out of these 30 years, 14 were from, you know, retired general. If you take that house, you can calculate how many military rule we have had. That is the reason why civility has been taken into those being in Nigeria. And what you see, the opera you see around, is everywhere. There is no way in that kind of system the macroeconomists who has policies and tools could design policies that would be very effective. And that is why it's carrying a load. And sometimes the macroeconomists think that it's a Spider-Man. My people say that it is where we have trees that monkey will jump. In Nigeria, I don't think the, monk, the trees are close. And that is why we are jumping as macroeconomists and we're not being effective for like 60 years. That is the situation we have. Let me move some, for, some step further. And let me look at the economics from 1960 to date. Pre to 1999, Nigeria had about six development plans. And I use development plan as my case study because these are documents designed by economics to fine tune outcomes of the country over time. Pre to 1999, we have about six. If I look at this development plan, all the objectives are almost the same. Number one of them is economic diversification. They want to reduce employment. They want to increase income. Private-led government industrialization. Till today, this issue has not been achieved. And till today, these things still reflect in our development plans. It means that prior to 1999, all that we did with development plans and all the money we spent, we could not say that we achieved this objective. It's not because the macroeconomists don't know what they are doing. It's because there is a foundation that is fighting with the system in respect of the good policies that were put in place. And this is the reason why the macroeconomists is in to Nigeria. Take some step further. Post-1999, we had three development plans, the National Economic Empowerment and Development Strategy, Vision 2020, and Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. The objectives are almost the same, okay? They are almost the same. But let me talk about Vision 2020, for instance. Vision 2020 says that by the year 2020, Nigeria should be the 20th largest economy in the world, okay? And they wanted to achieve that with efficient use of human capital and natural resources to wrap for rapid economic growth. That was very fine. And then the objectives of the ERGP were just, are also there. But let me show some, some graphs to show us the performance of these plans. The performance of these plans. Now, if you look at the, the NIS document, you find out that the only thing that were, was actually achieved in, this, in, in the NIS document was actually the growth, tri, uh, growth targets. Growth targets were, were achieved, but the only major problem was that this growth was not inclusive enough. So with a rising population that is rising faster than growth, you could see the reason why today our unemployment is about 33.3. .3. In fact, the last time I was checking the figures, PhD holders were also unemployed in Nigeria. What a story that we can tell about a country after 60 years. Right? The same thing we could say about Vision 2020. Vision 2020 figures are there, the next figure. And if you look at that figure, our plan is, was to ensure that Nigeria was the 20th largest economy. But at, after, you know, the period of that plan, we were 30th country, 30th largest economy. My question is that we still have 10 years lagging behind. And I don't even think that we actually moved so much, you know, up the ladder. But some things were the major reasons why some of these projections were not achieved. Because they had projection and actual figures. And some of these reasons were inadequate infrastructure, weak institutions, inadequate energy supply, and then issues about corruption. These are the reasons why these things were not actually achieved. Some of the, these outcomes or projections were not achieved. And the truth is that it's 
not because these documents were not well drafted. But like I said, there is a foundational issue. And that has been the, the story till now. And let me tell you the Nigerian case as I proceed. Nigeria is like a country where a man, you know, hand over a building to his children. And three of them were from the wives that were married, but others were minority because probably they were from concubine. And they, they, th they thought that, and the father said somebody should be in control of the building. And so they were, the man was in control, but after some time they were united to fight the man out, thinking that they needed to own the wealth given to them by their father so that they can grow it. Maybe from a building they can move it to, to a mansion, to a nation, and then create wealth for everybody to live. But immediately they took over, they divided the house into different place. The same foundation, but the foundation was faulty because they never had a vision to move the country forward. And therefore, they did all of that. And at the end, the only thing that was moving forward was that they were giving belts within that small building that they could not increase. And at the end, the building was so small to contain them. And that is why you see conjecture everywhere in Nigeria. Atrocities. So, so you see minority people fighting for restructuring, all kind of story, confab, several stories going around. So, and at the end of all of this, we have not been able to find a solution. The reason is not far-fetched. It's not because the macroeconomists have not designed policies for us. And sometimes we, 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 we pass the blame to the macroeconomists when things are not working well. But it's not the fault of the macroeconomists. That's a foundational issue that is fighting us. And because we have regional interest in mind, not a national vision and a philosophy that could guide the kind of constitution that could take us forward. And that is what we are facing today. Let me just proceed further. To just say that the macroeconomists are just three, three, two policies. Two. Number one is called macroeconomic, I mean, uh, fiscal policy and the other one is called monetary policy. Now, these policies are applied and the application is a function of whether, I mean, the effect is a function of whether we, uh, you are operating a fixed exchange rate regime or a flexible exchange rate regime. These are the only tools that are available. Now, the effect differ. For instance, if you are operating an expansionary fiscal policy and I present to us just an open macroeconomic model. Don't worry, I'm going to explain that and I'll leave the mathematics, right? Now, if it's an expansion of fiscal policy, the effect can be either negative or positive, depending on the channel that at where the other one. There are two channels. One is income channel and interest channel. Now, if you have an expansion of fiscal policy, the income, income will increase because that's what government is targeting with their budget. But the implication of that is that for a country that depends on import, it's going to trigger import. So balance of payment will be weighed down, will, 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 will be affected. Interest rate is going to attract capital because we want foreign capital to come in. But these two will be fighting because you want capital to come in that is positive, but the positive one may not be that much compared to the negative one that comes from increase in income. And that will erode away the positive effect that we should have. Over the years, Nigeria has implemented deficit financing, right? Right from, in fact, in the year 2018, the World Bank said that Nigeria is the only oil producing country that is running the deficit budget as at that time. Now, the truth is that we have run deficit budget all through. That's an expansionary fiscal policy. And the effect can be positive or negative, depending on whether you're operating fixed or flexible. Now, if it's fixed, it means that you will deplete your foreign reserve. And that is why today everybody is looking at the foreign reserve. It's like the only thing everybody is looking at and they don't want to sleep is foreign reserve. In fact, the CBN don't sleep when foreign reserve is going down. In 2020, 2017, 2020, when foreign reserve began to move, we found ourselves in negative growth because foreign reserve is very important. But if you're operating a flexible exchange rate, the implication that the exchange rate is an automatic price adjuster. It will adjust and equilibrium and it will either depreciate to correct whatever gap that comes in. So imagine running a deficit financing for all these years that we have and it can be positive or negative you can look at the effect we have and the kind of figures we have after 60 years. The same thing for monetary policy. Monetary policy effect is, is one way. One way in the sense that if it's expansion of monetary policy, it's going to have negative impact, okay, but contractionally we have. That is why in theory we say that there's an assignment problem. Assign monetary policy to external and then fiscal policy to, to domestic because fiscal policy is either positive or negative. And the truth is that do we actually consider all of this before we formulate and the government go ahead to implement them in our country? This is one question that is also begging to be answered. But the political will and the foundational issue is one of the reasons why these things are the way they are. So let me just conclude, take a step further to just highlight some of the binding constraints that I've mentioned and why the macroeconomics is in fret. Number one is that I've put, put across to us that where there is no vision, the people perish. And when we took over from 1960, there was no document to show where we wanted to be that could determine the kind of constitution, the kind of people, and what we, were, we expect from the country. And so today, you are seeing what we have. Thinking that even your next non-neighbor is now your enemy. 
Because we don't see ourselves as brothers. We are seeing ourselves as enemy because there is nothing that is binding all, down, us together. There's no way in that kind of a system you implement policies. Those policies will be, will be thwarted by personal interest, nepotism, and some of these things that are all out there because there is this foundation that has problem. Number two thing is that we have a structural defense. Structural defense is that we move from the UK parliamentary system to a US parliamentary system without due consideration into our diversity. Diversity in religion, in, in tribe, in, in culture, in resources, and all of that. These things were not actually considered, and you can see why we are where we are. Moved about almost 774 local governments. That is huge, 37 states. We have how many, how many House of Red members? Just at the center, top heavy. You know, there was this time the legal state governor gave a, gave a directive to, the, to a police officer somewhere in Magodo, and then he refused the, the directive, and there was this opera around. This is what could happen in a country where the center is everything. We are operating a unitary federalism. And that is why, even though we have federating unit that should be powerful, but a, just a common police could disobey the order of the, what you call the chief security officer in the state. Let me move for, further to conclude to say that, Madam Vice Chancellor, I have actually had some contributions in the field. And uh, you've just read my citation as well. But to add that, my publications are in macroeconomics, international finance, economic modeling, with keen interest on macroeconomic modeling, simulations, exchange rate management, global financial flows, financial institutions, and growth sustainability. This publication in public domain, in, in reputable journals. But over the years also, uh, I have participated in some training, and one of them was my church. I have opportunity to, opportunity to attend a training in my church that used to take place in the U.S., called Global Leadership Summit. And one of the leadership sites that I've come to cherish is called the Multiplier Leader. And the implication of that leadership is that you multiply yourself in others and make them better and allow them to fly. Over the years, I have inspired, mentored, and multiplied myself across the world. In fact, in this hall, I have several of my students and across the world, several, several of my students doing very well. In fact, somebody flew in from South Africa as a student, currently a lecturer, because of this lecture. I have several of them. And also to add, that seated in this hall are four of our best and, and they were at the time my master's and PhD student. And I'm talking about Dr. Kundayo, Mr. Gan, Dr. Olani Evans, Dr. Friday, Aneto, and Mr. Godwin Eden. And I'm proud of them, and I see them flying, and I'm happy. These are some of my contributions. But let me conclude with some appreciations. Madam Vice Chancellor. I will begin my uh, acknowledgement by first thanking the Almighty God. Jesus is my Redeemer and my Waymaker. The reason why I can stand before you is because of God. And I thank Him for all of this. I also want to extend my unwavering appreciation also to the Pan Atlantic University, the University Management Council, the Senate members for sustaining a system of inclusiveness, irrespective of gender, background, ethnicity, and religion that allows everybody to thrive. This is the kind of system that I'm talking about. If we can have this kind of system in Nigeria, and if Nigeria can replicate this, I'm sure that we will have a good country. A country that does not look at where you come from, is, it does not matter whether you, you are Muslim, Christian, or minority or majority. It gives you equal participation to fly. And that is the system we have here. That is Pan-Atlantic University. Thank you so much for having this kind of a system. I also want to thank our own dear Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonondo. The registrar, Mr. Kingsley Okawa, o o o uh, sorry for, for the name, Okawa, my dean, Dr. Sholaoni, and other deans that are seated there and head of departments. I also want to thank the former vice chancellor, Professor Juan Elegido, prof uh, the former dean of School of Social and Management Sciences, Professor Chantal Epie. I'm thanking them because it was their time I was given the opportunity to be employed in this university. I want to thank all the staff and students of the Pan-Atlantic University, particularly Dr. Uh, Lucia Govisen, Dr. Oliombo, Dr. Suji, uh, Dr. Awarinde, Dr. Dakari. Uh, if I don't mention them, please, you are in my heart. You have heard great people that I've met, and you have inspired me so much. You inspired me so much, and it's good working with you. Let me seize this opportunity to acknowledge the deep gratitude I owe to my family. First, I want to thank my grandfather, my late grandfather is not here. I'm thanking him because I remember as a young boy when I go to the village, he would take me to his room and say, please, I was a businessman in Lagos. And along the line, I find myself in the village. 
build a house in Lagos, but as I speak to you, I found out that the kind of terrain we come from, you need education. So if you are going for education, do a first degree, a second degree, a third degree. If there is fourth, do. If there is fifth, don't stop. That thing inspired me. It's late now. His name is Thompson Duke. It's late. And also my grandmother that I was always very close with. But I also want to thank my father. My father is in this hall, Mr. Roger Rea. Sir, you can stand up. That's my father. This man is a great man. Not educated, but I learned things more than education. That is why I think that Nigeria, we need something more than formal education. I learned principle, values, and sincerity from him. He said every system, according to him, when I was growing, he said every system is governed by principle and values. If you adhere to these principles, you don't need to outsmart anybody. You will rise. As a small boy, those things, I hold on to those things. Right? My mother could not come. She's not here, but I'm also grateful to her. She's a good woman. And also we have here my stepmothers, and then my uncles are also here. I have two uncles here, Uncle Jaffet, and then I have uh, Uncle Steven, and all my siblings that are here. Thank you so much. But especially I have, I want to thank my family. My wife is seated here. Her name is Mrs. Patient Area, and my three children. God bless me with three boys. The first one is divine. The second one is dominion. The third one is delight. Madam Vice Chancellor, this woman has sacrificed for me so much. Because I remember when I started my PhD, she was pregnant with my first son, and I traveled. So she struggled in the house. You know, you can imagine the fear and all of that. And when I came back, I was writing my thesis. So she thought that I'm back. But I, in, my, in the dining table was a printer and a laptop. That was the lady I was married to. Because I needed her to print materials and start reading and writing. So every day, morning to evening, I was reading and writing. She would talk to me sometimes and even come and bang the table. I was, I, I was not actually hearing her. So I almost sacrificed my social life. And then shortly after my finish, I finished my PhD, she thought that I am back. I never, she never knew that the journey of writing had just started. And along the line, I found myself in Abuja, met a friend of my doctor, Falabi Oleokiri, my very good friend and my twin brother. The little thing I found out in that guy is also with a laptop. He's always moving with a laptop like a police officer. And my life became complicated. So when I, when I returned back from Abuja, this continued. So she has, you know, it's actually a sacrifice. I wish that, I wish that after this public lecture, Madam Vice Chancellor, probably the university will give me time for me to regain my social life. <laughs> So, um, I love you so much, and I love my children. I thank you so much for the support and the sacrifice you, you've had. Also, I want to thank my pastors. Reverend Akinto Laoni is my pastor seated in this hall. Reverend Paul Ekediashi, I thank you so much for coming. Reverend Max Emadiele, thank you so much. Reverend Professor Karo Imebese, thank you so much. And also in this hall was one of my first pastors, Reverend and Mrs. Dele David. I thank you so much. 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 I also want to thank my PhD supervisors, Professor Do and Professor San. They are not here. But one thing I learned from them, which was that throughout when they supervised me, if I Professor Do supervised me for master, see, today I have not bought water for them. And I have not written a paper where I included their name. And we are still good friends. This is not common in this part of the world. I learned that from them. And I wish that we could take this on board. I wish that we could take it on board. I want to also thank. You know, the representative of the Minister of Budget and National Planning, a good friend, Mr. David Adioshun, the Director of Macroeconomics. Also a macroeconomist. He's the Director of Macroeconomics of the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. Thank you so much. I also have Professor Apanikbo, the former University Vice Chancellor in Macroeconomics, and then a former Director of YFEM, West Africa Institute for Financial and Economic Management. I want to thank Professor Wukoma, is a mentor and a father from the University of Lagos, the director of SEPA, <laughs> Professor Shola, Professor Akinleya, Professor Dauda, Professor Swaibu, Dr. Ajide, Dr. Ajuan, Dr. Shitu, and all those that came from the University of Lagos. I'm grateful. I want to thank the ED of NDIC, Mr. M.M. M. Ibrahim. I want to also thank um, my colleagues from NDIC, and then I want to proceed as well to thank 
in, in this all. So many of my friends and great people, Dr. Adeni, Dr. Yunola, Dr. Kilishi, and several of them. Represented in this all is also my former uh, secondary school mates. Here is Mr. Sholo Baremo, Mrs. Fumi, and all of those that came. I have my undergraduate mates that are here. Mr. Tobi and Mr. Shola Ibrunke, I am so, so grateful that you are here. My sister-in-law is here, Mrs. Evelyn Yeah, I thank you so much for your prayers and support. Mr. and Mrs. Abulu, I thank you so much for your support. Engineer Prelate Ere, thank you. He's a cousin. I thank you so much. And then barrister Mrs. Kuku, my sister. I remember when we were undergraduate, we were almost staying in the same house. Right? It's my sister and she's here. Thank you so much for coming and all your prayers and support. You've all been so, so good and so, so supportive to me. Thank you so much. I want to thank the CEO of NESG. Personally, they, they broadcasted this on their website. I want to thank you so much for, for, for that. Thank him so much. And he has a representative here. Thank you so much for coming. And all that came from TREM, my church, I want to thank you so much. I cannot mention all your name, but I, you are so good for me. All of you that are here, God bless you. I thank you so much. Let me conclude, Madam Vice Chancellor, distinguished members of this audience. In the past few minutes, my presentation has shown that Nigeria has celebrated its diamond jubilee in despair. And most importantly, macroeconomic, macroeconomic policies are among the pillars resting on a faulty foundation that I have put across to us. Thus, setting up the macroeconomics as the superman in Mondo. The Bible says, when the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is the situation of Nigeria, and that's why the macroeconomics is suffering. As a matter of urgency, I recommend the following to salvage Nigeria. Number one is that we need a national vision and a philosophy that will guide us where we want to go and determine the kind of constitution, the kind of people, the kind of nation we want to have. Because that is very important because it will take cognizance of our diversity without leaving anybody behind. That is the foundation that we need to correct. And if we correct that, our policies will work. We need to develop a constitution along that, along that line and ensure we have structural planning. What we have is functional planning. Functional planning is a situation where you plan with structures that are no more good. That is a faulty foundation. And lastly, plan with structures that are no more good. That is a faulty foundation. And lastly, I recommend that we need industrial relevant human capital. And I say this because today Nigeria unemployment is going to about 31.3 and it's still increasing. And we are already in the fourth industrial revolution. And therefore we need to change some of our curriculum because our population is going to be about 400 million people in the year 2020. This is what we need to do and ensure that we are training people that are relevant to the generation that we are looking into. Thank you so much for listening to me. Distinguished audience, I thank you for your kind attention and safe journey back to your respective des destinations. Thank you. Let's keep the applause going. <laughs> we may sit, please. Are there any who were typing out questions to ask? Well, the nature or the tradition of an inaugural lecture is that. Um, the lecturer gets to be the one to speak. We don't have a, <laughs> the right to ask any questions. <laughs> um, so ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of this event. Before we depart, I want to take a few moments. Thank God for this beautiful day and for our university. Our thanks in an eminent way goes to Professor Herrera, whose commitment to scholarship is the reason we have gathered today. Uh, we thank his immediate family for being a pillar of support for him. We thank all our guests for gracing this occasion, especially, especially our colleagues from the other universities, visiting professors. But I will make special mention to those from the faculty, or sorry, from the Department of Economics of the University of Lagos, ably led by Professor W.A. Ishala. Thank you very much. 
We thank the members of the Governing Council in a particular way. Um, we also thank members of the University Senate, management faculty, staff, and students of Pan Atlantic University. Thank you, everyone. Just an announcement. The procession will leave this auditorium in reverse order. All are to remain standing until the procession leaves the auditorium completely. Afterwards, guests can then exit the auditorium. Light refreshments will be served at the foyer. And just to note, everyone who is wearing the academic regalia are to remove them once we leave the auditorium. But throughout the period of the cocktail, only Professor Erega reserves the right to keep on his academic regalia. <laughs> And so now we rise. University anthem, please. Thank <laughs> you. 